So I would like to introduce uh, my speaker, Maggie Chao. Uh, Maggie is a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University's Society of Fellows. She received her PhD from in history of art and architecture at Harvard uh, in uh, 2014. Her research focuses on American art and material culture of the long 19th century, particularly the artistic negotiation of scientific and uh, economic paradigm uh, shifts. She is currently working on a book entitled Episodes at the End of Landscape, which examines the dissolution of landscape painting as a major cultural project in the late 19th century uh, United States. So very fittingly, she is now presenting um, a paper called Martin Jackson Heat's Anti-Landscapes. church, and we have many others by church, 
um, which dates from, in this letter, it dates from uh, 1868, and in it he writes, quote, I tried the effect of one of your sons just peeping over the horizon. That is the only touch in which I've imitated you, and that I do not intend, so don't charge me with stealing your thunder. So emerging from this obviously complicated relationship of mentorship and camaraderie are churches, uh, are, are Heath's Marsh pictures. A subject that he explored extensively while working out of church's studio amidst his paintings, which he helped to ship and frame on occasion. To understand Heath's deep investment in the Marsh as a pictorial subject, we need first to recognize just how antithetical it was to the goals of church and his followers. For chief among their concerns was what I would call the narrative potential of landscape painting. That is, the spectator's feeling when looking at a picture of being before real space, that he might step in and experience it in all of its sensory dimensions. In the words of Asher B. Durand, one of Durand's paintings, who was the founder of the National Academy of Design and probably the Hudson River School's most prolific theorist, um, Durand writes, landscape should, quote, draw you into it so you traverse it, breathe its atmosphere, feel its sunshine, and repose in its shade. Americanists have long recognized that such imagined traversal and occupation enabled 19th century viewers to participate in national narratives of progress and power, and nowhere is this trope more visible than here in Durand's own 1853 painting, Progress, the Advance of Civilization, where um, you can see figures moving along a waterside path here, um, first in wagons and boats and trains, enacting an ideal narrative of westward expansion and technological advancement through their spatial relations within the picture. We not only see similar formulas at work in church's landscapes, but we see them reworked to greater effect. His 1859 Heart of the Andes, for instance, offers beholders a richly detailed foreground that gives way to a textured strata in the middle ground and then opens pathways to the triumphal distant peaks. Now, Church's improvement on the construction of landscape was the invention of the composite, the stitching together of multiple viewpoints into a single composition, a strategy that gives the fiction of traversal even more epistemological force. Thus, in experiencing this picture, one could come to know or symbolically possess not just a particular prospect or single environment, but the whole of the Andes with its good title claims from misty jungle to snow-capped peak. And at exhibitions for this painting, which attracted tens of thousands of paying visitors, the oversized uh, picture was even accompanied by printed pamphlets guiding beholders through the represented scene as if on a tour of real space. Heath's landscapes, by contrast, display a different set of ambitions. It is not so much that his paintings refuse imagined inhabitation. They are, after all, as you can see, full of sensuous details, both atmospheric and botanical. But it is that they make light of the whole endeavor of experiencing landscape in this way. While Church's work and his exhibition program that very much went along with it mythologized the experience of the artist himself, who was celebrated for his intrepid travels through supposedly infernal terrain, um, his ambitions were on the surface modest. He painted a local landscape of little note. I want to suggest, though, that such absence of ambition, a kind of self-destruction, if you will, was deliberate, that Heath's paintings worked against the dominant ideology of 19th century landscape painting, and by extension, what many art historians have seen as the imperialist and ecologically destructive land projects that the genre justified and fueled. What differentiates Heath most from his peers is his subject matter. 
he chose to paint wetlands, and not any wetlands. And wetlands, by the way, um, I should just say, is, is a, a term that did not exist in his lifetime. It is a product of the environmental movement. Um, so this is quite a specific type of landscape um, that was quite was very ubiquitous in the eastern United States, the salt marsh, a saline intertidal zone between land and sea. We now associate such grassy expanses with wildlife refuges and idyllic open spaces, but during the 1860s and 70s, they were considered wastelands impeding the progress of urban development and therefore a highly unorthodox subject of painting. To quote a naturalist writing in 1864, there are few scenes more dreary and depressing than an extensive salt marsh. And even the marsh's limited usefulness, its production of wild hay, which you see stacked in many of his paintings, annually harvested by local farmers, was understood in sensorially negative terms. As one newspaper reporter put it, quote, laboring in these fields that rest on watery foundations is not attended with Arcadian charm. Men work mowing, raking, and staking the coarse, rank grass after the primitive method and are sometimes caught in a treacherous mire. The fragrance is that wafted from the sluggish ditches and stagnant pools choked with decaying vegetation for years. Unquote. Probably couldn't get worse than that. And though adjacent to the eastern seaboards, beaches, and rocky cliffs, the marsh is arguably is, is, is a neglected aesthetic and arguably social other of coastal terrain. It's worth noting that he began his landscape career painting the ocean vistas beyond the marsh, the site of exclusive resorts and fashionable summer residences. Thus, painting the marsh constitutes even a literal level of geography of turning of one's back on the proper view. As a landscape that's not worth noticing, let alone exploring, the marsh was antithetical to the narrative priorities of landscape painting. What is more, a virtual traveler before Heath's paintings would encounter only obstacles, flooded meadows, brimming streams, and soggy ground into which he would sink rather than stand tall. In that sense, such pictures worked against landscape by participating in a counter discourse of non traversability that grew out of the many failed efforts to turn wetlands into solid earth during this period. The 1860s and 70s marked a major push for wetland reclamation in the United States, and not just on the eastern seaboard where he had painted, but also notably in California where. Um, Valley floodplain was transformed into that the you know, very productive and problematic agricultural region that we know it as today. Aiming to expand transportation networks, city boundaries, and arable land, mid 19th century developers used rather unreliable methods of draining and diking. Their successes were often short lived because they lacked both a firm understanding of flood management and faced retaliation from farmers and fishermen dependent on the marsh for their livelihood. Risky speculation, hindered movement, and questionable foundations came to define marshlands in New England and the Mid-Atlantic during this reclamation boom. While newspapers boasted that vast acreage worth little or nothing could be easily converted into lucrative real estate, Reclaimed land constantly reminded residents of its former wetness and its precariousness as a surface for inhabitation. A New England uh, newspaper reported in 1873 that accidents at a local train station built on a salt marsh, have, salt marsh had become frequent as, quote, solid earth is so scarce that it is difficult to drive, unload, and turn without getting upset, unquote. And in Boston, where developers transformed 450 acres of marsh in the back of Bay and South End into fashionable residential neighborhoods, an adjacent basin was inadvertently transformed into a stagnant drainage ditch. William Dean Howells um, described this quote unquote new land in one of his novels as quote, smelling like the hold of a ship after a three years' voyage whenever builders broke ground to construct new houses. 
and it was not, and this is just a map of Boston's increasing acreage, which is most of the city is actually built on wetlands. Um, and, and it was not until much later in the century when Olmsted corrected this problem by, by recreating a marsh in the place of this basin to make the fence. And even then, he refused to call it a park um, because of its lack of aesthetic appeal. In the period accounts of reclamation gone awry, the land's watery past was constantly seeping to the surface, revealing the marsh itself as suffering resistant to settlement. Keith's landscapes are not only unorthodox in their subject matter, but also in their defiance of certain pictorial conventions. For the period, his paintings are empty and almost formulaically simple with their longest thin views. Period viewers who were conditioned to seeing the dramatic and topographically diverse environments created by Durand and Church often noted its absence in Heath's work. Critics lamented his what they called his wearisome horizontal lines and perspective and his monotony of flatness and found his paintings, quote, lacking in every feature of grasping after the theatrical or sensational. Yet despite accusations that he, was, he must be weak as to composition, he expressed a lifelong preference for painting where, quote, the scenery is perfectly flat. This feature of land itself, its flatness, often gives Heat's paintings the look of a novice's lesson in linear perspective. Like the nodes of a perspectival grid, Heat's methodically plotted haystacks and streams do not so much represent uh, do not so much present topography as mark its absence. They both reduce the illusion of deep space and reveal themselves, reveal themselves as the components of a system used to create it, revealing, in a sense, the landscape painting's ideological program as a compositional project. Next to Church's topographical exoticism, a painting like Marshfield Meadows offers landscapes bare bones, its pictorial structure without incident, a landscape absent of those qualities making it inhabitable, traversable, navigable. Nowhere is this more evident than in Heath's self-destructing picture. In this landscape turned still life, the entire premise of landscape painting as an illusionistic and traversable space is turned on its head. Here's a picture that pointedly calls attention to the genre's illusionism with the humorous conceit of water turning truly fluid. And here you have the water. This play with shifting levels of reality recalls Trompeau, or fool the eye painting, which aims uh, to trick the viewer into confusing a painted surface with the actual material objects that it represents. And there's a long history in Western painting of trompe still lives that feature artworks as metaphor pictures in shallow space, which Heath's painting seems to replicate, though with a garbled syntax. In Heath's scenario, the lower margin executed like an amateur sketch, complete with cartoonish figure, and this is later dubbed a gremlin, though the invention of that word postdates the painting. Um, but that this, this section here, because it's sort of so, uh, so amateurish and sketchy, seems to disclose the picture's own trickery. The pleasure of Trompoy, that aha moments when you recognize your own gullibility in the face of the artist's virtuosity, which is the main point of such works, is denied in Heath's picture. Here we have a landscape calling its own bluff. Even so, the reference to Trompe is fitting and surely uh, intended for Trompe itself traffics in self-conscious play with pictorial convention. In an essay on Trompeau, uh, Jean, uh, Jean Baugiard defines the technique as anti-painting, a practice that is not so much art historical as metaphysical. He suggests that Trompeau is, is to painting as the anagram is to literature, a form of ritualistic perversion. And for him, 
specifically a perversion of still life. So while still life, um, I'm just showing you a popular painting, it's still life painting from the same period. So in still life, um, you, still life uses illusionism to preserve the weight of real things by means of pictorial horizontality that they're often on the tabletop, depth of field, a horizon, atmosphere. Um, Trompoy, on the other hand, inverts each of these protocols in turn, making weightlessness and verticality its central conditions. In other words, it makes surreal every illusionistic effect formulated in the name of pictorial realism. Now, along these same lines, we might say that Kremlin in the studio is a kind of anti-landscape, which in the manner of Trompoy, perversely restructures landscape's form of address. By turning his own landscape into an object within the painting, he places the conventional horizontality of landscape on the vertical field undoing its illusions of depth, its traversability, and its human scale. Recalling the formulaic structure of his marsh landscapes, he constructs here a perspectival grid that enfolds the meta picture into its surrounding space, the so-called studio in title. Um, the logs, which you see here, on which the painting is propped, emerges from the depth of the room and coincides with the orthogonals of the marsh painting they support. So if you extend them into space, uh, into the depth of space, you'll find that these logs um, follow the landscape's recession, meeting at the embedded picture's horizon, just the place where you might expect to find the setting sun. And perhaps this too is gestured, I think, by the, this ambitious figure here um, below the canvas, like perhaps the, the sun that's sunk below the horizon. <laughs> this reorientation of horizontal to vertical, an unlandscaping, if you will, is best marked by the leaking water and growing puddle on the floor. Taken literally, this might be a waterlogged canvas propped up to drip dry. An apt image for what we might understand as the conversion of terrestrial ground to pictorial ground. While this painting pokes fun at Heath's own landscapes, it nevertheless carries ample reference to Frederick Church, in whose studio it was almost certainly painted. The 1909 Herald account, with which I began my talk, credits Church for sabotaging Heath's landscape, rendering it out of scale and out of place. What I see at work here is the reverse, a parody at Church's expense. The easel constructed of whole logs evokes Church's oversized canvases, and the water running over the edge of the canvas seems to parody Church's cascades, which so often populated the middle grounds of his tropical pictures, as you see in Heart of Andes. That this parodying of church as narrative landscapes is performed using the salt marsh is particularly meaningful since wet ground, literal excess water, is what prevents horizontal passage in actual land. This painting thus connects intersecting narratives of drainage, a playful undoing or outdoing of one landscape by an landscapist by another, and physical drainage ecological destruction brought by the period's wetland reclamation projects. Here, Heed's joke on church, or churches on Eve, if you want to believe the legend, quite literally takes the form of emptying something of its liquidity. Water removed from the marsh on one level of reality and from the canvas on the other. Ecological forms of drainage, furthermore, preoccupied church in his other works as well from this period. In addition to salt marsh landscapes, he was also known for depicting orchids, plants popularly believed to be parasitic, even despite the best efforts of 19th century botanists to convince the public otherwise. And orchids, just a side note, they grow on other plants, but they are not, they don't take any nutrients from them. The orchid's parasitism, its draining of the host plant's nutrients, is central to churches, uh, sorry, to Heath's paintings which feature oversized, saturated, and animate blossoms encircled by bare tree limbs draped with 
gray mosses that you can see here, and almost deathly still hummingbirds. In Heed's Marsh paintings, we can imagine oh, excuse me. We can imagine a similar, uh, less visible generation of waste and ruin through drainage, or perhaps foresee the muck and stench of reclamation. And this, so in this paper, I've tried to trace two narratives. One art historical about landscapes as a genre, the other eco-critical about the challenges of reclamation that resonate still today. I just want to show this slide. In New York, for instance, where I live, extreme weather, like Hurricane Sandy a few years ago, severely damaged those coastal zones, which um, are uh, below the tide. Sorry, in, that are in the, in the tidal zone where once marshes served as a natural buffer, and yet wetlands are still being replaced by pavement at what I read recently as a rate of 2,000 acres a year on the Atlantic coast. And this is just an image I pulled from a website that overlays the um, historic wetlands in green with the um, evacuation zones from Hurricane Sandy, just to show the kind of overlap there. Now, whether he was an ecological painter in the full sense of the word is probably impossible to say, since it's hardly historically sound, that category at this time. Nevertheless, when he exploited the physical instability of marsh environments to visualize cultural insecurities surrounding traversable land and its representation, he was engaging a kind of pictorial revisionism that was inextricably embedded in environmental concerns. Keed's investment in the conventions of landscape painting was perhaps a condition of his insecure position within his artistic circle. But in the end, his work recognizes in astute ways the particular incapacity of his genre to uphold its ideological meaning in the context of destructive environmental modernity. 